Good afternoon, Natalie. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Dr. Lim. Good to see you too. So thanks for taking the time to um, come into this webinar to share your story. And um, it is much appreciated by myself, uh, but also I'm sure by the patients who will be watching this webinar to understand your journey of long COVID and the partial recovery that you've had since we last met about seven weeks ago. So I guess, first of all, can you tell us a bit about yourself, what you do, how old you are and when you caught COVID? I'm 31. I live in London and I'm a freelance radio journalist. Um, I caught COVID um, over Christmas. So I tested positive on the 27th of December last year, 2020. My um, partner works in the hospital on the front line and he brought it back um, from there. And then um, I had a really mild um, initial 10 days, so had mild symptoms, the, the initial 10 days. I had a bit of a dry cough. Um, I was feeling a bit unwell, sort of a malaise. Um, but then um, on the 10th day, I started having these palpitations and that's really, it went a bit downhill from there, I'd say. I was even walking around and doing some light exercise while I had COVID, maybe that wasn't advisable, but I felt really like normal, uh, so to say. But yeah, then on the, I think it was on the 7th that I called my first ambulance in, in my life because I thought I was having a heart attack. My heart just started racing out of nowhere and I just didn't understand what it was. And what were you doing when the heart started racing? Were you exercising lightly or were you doing, doing anything significant? I was sitting down um, watching something on my laptop and having a coffee, which I've, I was a very heavy coffee drinker before, like four cups um, a day. Now I don't drink any coffee anymore, but uh, yeah, that's what seemed to have triggered it in that moment. And just tell me, the. Um the coffee if you were to try coffee or make the mistake of having another coffee now would it certainly set off your palpitations i'm too scared to try it but um i mm. think um i think i'm pretty sure it would because i've made the mistake a few times of having some dark chocolate with a high coca content and it really it really set me off and made me feel very uncomfortable my palpitations were very very um, noticeable and I, I i regretted that choice Okay, so I mean, here, here, here's a question. Apart from the palpitations, have you, have you had any other symptoms uh, after the initial 10 days of COVID? The palpitation was the first thing. And then a few days later, I started experiencing shortness of breath when I was walking. Um, and then, but it didn't stop after I was walking. It, was, it felt like I couldn't take in a full breath, like almost like an elephant was sitting on my chest and restricting my breathing in a way, which again was something I didn't experience during the initial um, phase um, of, of the acute phase of COVID. After, after a few more days, I noticed that the palpitations, they seemed to mainly happen when I was standing up. So they were the worst in the morning when I would stand in the kitchen, make my porridge and just stand still and stir my pot. I, I'm wearing this um, fitness tracker, so it's, it detects my heart rate, so I could see that my heart rate was going up to 120, 130 from just standing there and stirring the pot. So um, yeah, that was one thing. And I would get these adrenaline surges at night, um, what felt like my body was ready to be in fight or flight mode. And um, it woke me up and then my heart started racing again. Um, at night as well, even when I was lying down. So yeah, these were the symptoms um, that were most bothersome for me. Some headaches um, and some other weird like sensations in my hands where it was a bit, um, felt a bit numb, but that was very, very short lived and didn't really bother me for a long time. And did you have any symptoms in your bowels uh, as well? Either diarrhea or constipation? Um, no, not noticeably. I think during, during my initial COVID I had a I had a bit of um, diarrhea, but it wasn't too bad. So I wasn't sure whether it was to do with the COVID or not, um, mm. but nothing too, too severe, no. Okay. And what about fatigue and concentration? Initially not. And then I started feeling a lot um, more tired. Um, also, I used to be someone who was exercising a lot before I got COVID. So I'd work out six days a week. Um, I went to that to a gym and was very, very active. And so... Um, yeah, I wonder, you know, that I wasn't doing that anymore. So how much of the fatigue was maybe to do with that? But it never got to the stage where I had a few days where I couldn't really get out of bed. But I wonder how much of that was to do with the palpitations as well. But it never really got to the point where 
I couldn't do anything because I was so fatigued. So I know other long haulers have it much worse than me, the fatigue and the concentration issues. Um, never really um, affected me too badly, I have to say, compared to you know, these other symptoms. You mentioned earlier on, uh, prior to coming online, that sleep was also uh, a major issue. Do you think sleep has been deteriorating from day 10 or was it one of those symptoms that came on later, let's say day 20, day 30? I would say um, it would have been more of a day 20 around, around that time um, when it started happening. It mainly is because it seems that these surges of adrenaline or um, yeah, that happens a few times during the night. I can, again, I mean, I don't know how accurate my fitness tracker data is, but it, it um, records my sleep and its stress levels based on heart rate variability. And before I got sick, um, it was all, I was all resting all throughout the night. And now I'll get these spikes of stress, which correlates with what I perceive to be these surges of adrenaline. Sometimes it's when I get too hot at night. Um, so that seems to be a trigger. But yeah, that means that my sleep is a bit disrupted and then I feel less rested throughout the day and a bit more fatigued, but um, yeah. Thanks for, for, for sharing all these very important points. And actually, these are symptoms that are in common with some other patients that I uh, see. So um, I run, as you might know, the Imperial Syncope Diagnostic Unit. And I also am one of the cardiologists at Welbeck. And Part of the group experience that we've had and we've published on is this phenomena called autonomic dysfunction in long COVID. And this, in my experience, is a partial explanation or a full explanation for the 50 to 60% of patients who have the kind of symptoms you describe. And one of the most, in my view, specific symptoms that you have described this afternoon is the fact that your symptoms get worse when you stand up and also the other telltale sign is your symptoms are worse than the mornings and i, I want to try and uh, take a, a bit of time to explain why that might be and maybe then talk about some of the interventions that are possible and the interventions that you have had this this diagram really illustrates what happens in the context of autonomic dysfunction in, in long COVID. now as it says on the website name, Stop Fainting is a resource that's freely available to help guide patients to stop having what we call basal syncope or a common faint. But what we're finding very interestingly with a cohort of patients who have long COVID or long hauler COVID is that they get symptoms when they're standing up that are exacerbated. So the palpitation, shortness of breath, sweatiness, dizziness, fatigue, and sometimes brain fog, uh, and even gastrointestinal symptoms, which thankfully you don't have, can all be exacerbated when you stand up. And if I just show you very briefly what happens, when you first stand up, your blood pressure falls ever so slightly. I'm going to take a screenshot now. And this, this blood pressure fall, uh, occurs because a bit of your uh, blood is starting to pull down into your lower limbs here. And this blood that's pulling into your lower limbs will necessarily empty the heart a little bit here. And therefore the blood pressure has fallen a, a little bit. Now, this is typically not a problem because people compensate in a way that maintains the blood pressure that I'll explain later on. But if you stand, particularly on a hot day, or if you're very dehydrated, or for example, first thing in the morning, when you are likely to be the most dehydrated, you will be in a 24 hour period. Why? Because A, you don't drink anything overnight. Most people don't. Most people are sleeping throughout the night. So they're producing urine. And like you said, when it's hot at night, you sweat under the sheets or you vasodilate. And you may not realize you're sweating because you evaporate straight away. That is a way you cool down. But all through the night, you're losing water through sweating, through breathing. When you breathe against a cold window, you'll see the moisture build up against that cold window. You are losing that every time you breathe at night and you're producing urine. So the first thing in the morning is when you're most likely to be very dehydrated. And when you're dehydrated and you stand up, you get this phenomena where the blood pressure starts to fall greater. So here, what you can see is that the blood pressure 
or the blood volume falls into the lower limbs. And this blood starts to fill up the lower limbs here. You can see that filling. And because of that, the heart here starts to empty of blood and the blood pressure falls down slightly. So here we have a situation where blood pressure falls. And the blood pressure falls because the cardiac or, or the stroke volume, that means each stroke of this heartbeat is reduced, let's say in this extreme example, by 50%. So you're pushing up blood with 50% less volume than the previous heartbeat, just because you're standing and the blood is pooling. Now what that does is that you have very sensitive receptors in your neck here, and this is called the carotid baroreflex. And these sensors sense that your blood pressure is falling, send a signal to the brain. The brain reacts by giving you what's called a flight or fight response. And this response is also known as the adrenaline response or the stress response. Adrenaline, cortisol, stress. And these are all the stress hormones that are released when you're standing up. And all it takes is a stand. And the reason you need adrenaline is because when it's released, it does a very helpful thing in the case of low blood pressure it will boost the heart rate because ultimately stroke volume times heart rate equals the cardiac output. That means how much fluid is circulating around your body in any one minute can be enhanced even in a relatively dry state by increasing your heart rate. And the way your heart rate is increased is through adrenaline. So adrenaline here, causes your heart rate to go up. And that explains one of your dominant symptoms, which is the palpitations. What adrenaline can also do is it can also cause vasoconstriction. This term means that the, um, that the vessels in your lower limbs are starting to squeeze. The direct impact of adrenaline on your vessels is to squeeze these vessels to push the blood back upwards. And this blood comes back into the heart, fills the heart, and then you down-regulate adrenaline. Now, that is what happens in most cases normally, including in you before COVID. Whenever you stood up, whenever I stand up, we tend to drop our volume a little bit with gravity. It's only natural. But because we have a slight adrenaline surge, our heart rate increases, and then we have a vasoconstrictor effect on our legs. Our heart fills again the blood is full of oxygen and blood and blood pressure that the adrenaline is then wound down in a space of five to ten seconds but in your case there is a spiral because you can't seem to keep enough blood pressure coming back to your heart so although it's trying very hard your fight or flight or stress response is trying very hard you are not creating enough cardiac output because you're pooling too much in your lower limbs and therefore, this vicious cycle continues. You still get a low blood pressure. That dials up more and more adrenaline, giving you more and more palpitations. But the adrenaline itself has a very, very important effect in that it makes your brain hypervigilant. And this is one of the potential explanations why sleep is very difficult in you. Because the vigilance you have with running on high all day and running on high doesn't mean psychologically you're high it means your adrenaline is high because you're standing upright because it needs to be high to maintain your cardiac output and this hypervigilant sleep uh, state will cause insomnia and will cause disturbed sleep will cause sweatiness and all this if you like are a manifestation of the adrenaline in your system so you very helpfully use the term fright or flight response it, feel sometimes that you're in a fright or flight mode. And I think that is exactly right. That is exactly what is happening in your body when you are in this state where when you stand up, the blood pulls down. So that's one way of explaining why you have the symptoms you, you have. And in fact, I had um, spoken with you a bit about this when we previously met. And one of the things that we had discussed were potential treatment options that we could um, employ to help improve the symptoms. Now, let me ask you, were you given drugs uh, by the team who saw you in hospital? 
It was, yeah. Um, they gave me some beta blockers, propranolol, um, yes. a, low, a low dose of that. Um, so they said I could take up to 40 milligrams a day, so 10 milligram tablets up to four times a day. Um, I think during my worst times, I, I think I got up to four, but usually I took about two um, for a while, usually in the mornings and then one and during you, lunchtime. Um, helpful? And did you yeah. find any side effects? The beta blockers? Um, at first I thought it was quite helpful because I think initially I found it really difficult to deal with all of this adrenaline and to understand what was going on and um, it helped dampen that response a little bit so um, it helped give my body a little bit of a break from time to time that was achieved I mean lying down gives me that bit of a break because that um, helps my symptoms but um, Obviously, you have to stand up from time to time. Um, so yeah, it helped with that a little bit. But then um, I, I think I stopped them about two weeks ago because um, I felt sometimes I was getting headaches, which was a bit of a side effect. And also they make you or make me tired a little bit. So fatigue is a side effect. And obviously, a lot of um, long haul patients have that problem with fatigue. So they, there could be an issue there. and. Um, I felt better for not having the side effects um, anymore um, at the moment, yeah. Now that I think you have a fair understanding of the, of the mechanism, and actually just going back one more step, long COVID can cause your symptoms to manifest, or one of the reasons it does so is that, in, in my view, long COVID resets your autonomic state. So it resets your set point for blood pressure control, for stroke volume, and for vasoconstriction. So it could be a dysautonomia of sorts because it affects the autonomic nervous system. And that is the nervous system that controls all the things that run automatically in your body, such as blood pressure, heart rate, breathing rate, uh, temperature regulation, uh, bowel regulation. And what COVID can do in the, in the longer term is it can reset these specific variables and so in particular with autonomic dysfunction which i still suspect strongly that you do have your blood pressure and filling is set at a lower set point than it was before you had covid and you probably feel this too because you're yeah yeah absolutely i like that was another that i forgot to mention but i think i have a blood pressure monitor at home and i found it difficult um to because I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about salt um, in, in the next step, but um, I was trying to get my blood pressure up a little bit to again, dampen that response that happens um, when, when I stand up. But the, the propranol specifically that I was taking the beta blocker, um, it did lower the blood pressure a little bit as well. So I feel like I was having, doing two counteracting things that didn't really work so well. So, um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't the. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it was the most effective drug for for this. What I was experiencing. Yeah. So it's it's often the the drug of choice though for people coming into accident and emergency because when people come in with the symptoms you're experiencing with a what we call a sinus tachycardia, and they experience palpitations, oftentimes a simple solution is to give people a beta blocker. But in in my experience, that can be helpful, as you said, to calm your fight or flight response, but can be detrimental in other respects. For example, beta blockers can be a treatment for hypertension or high blood pressure. And if you imagine the problem being low blood pressure, obviously it gives with one hand and it takes from another. So it dampens adrenaline, but then again, if your blood pressure reduces, you get even more adrenaline produced. So patients tend in the long term not to tolerate the beta blockers all that well because there are other strategies and we talked about some of these strategies previously and as you uh, as you already said the main conservative treatment which means non-drug therapy that i would advise would be first of all to really have a strong focus on fluid and salts so fluid and salts and how much fluid something like three liters a day how much salt something like 10 grams what kind of salt i prefer something like a complex uh, Himalayan pink, round rock salt, something like that. Now, tell me something. Have you have you started to have more fluid and salt? 
Absolutely, I'm following that religiously. I'm here with my bottle because I'm never without my bottle. And I make sure, especially in the morning, to I call it front loading to just make sure after that dehydration of the night to really um, increase that. And I found that obviously just having water isn't always, you, you might want to taste something different if you're drinking three liters and not um, exercising three hours a day that you would sweat it out. Um, I found that coconut water um, was quite uh, delicious. Also, it has some potassium in it, which um, is another electrolyte. So I think that probably has some, anyway, it, I, it tolerated it well. And the salt as well, um, what I found was I'm drinking some organic stock of, I'm using these organic stock cubes and they are quite to have, contain quite a lot of salt. So one stock cube will have around five grams of salt, the ones that I'm using. And mm. so just, um, drinking that throughout the day and adding a bit of table salt to that it makes it more pleasant so i don't have to over salt all of my food and and have you found that the morning routine with front loading of fluid to be helpful absolutely so i can i can tell a difference when i when i when i follow that the fluid and salt help me tolerate exercise a lot more when um i can tell when i will have um a cup of broth a very salty broth half an hour before uh, I do my recumbent exercise, which I'm sure we'll get onto as well. Um, I find that my heart rate doesn't spike as much and I feel like more able to do the exercise. That's perfect. So I didn't realize you had started to exercise again, which is very nice to hear. Um, yeah, no, I have. What, what kind of exercises have you started to do? My best friend got me something for my road bike, which um, is a stand that I can put in the flat and then um, I can, it's essentially like a home bicycle trainer. I've turned my bike into that. So because on my road bike, my position, I'm almost in a recovered position. I'm like very bent over. I find that it's, um, I tolerate that much better than, for example, going up the stairs because of gravity, I'm sure. And um, so on and off, I've been doing 30 minutes of that, but maybe once a week or something. And in the last two weeks, I was determined to, I was a bit scared to try it because I read a lot about post-exertional malaise and other um, long COVID patients triggering relapses with their exercise. And so I was always a bit scared, but now what I've been doing the last week actually is doing 40 minutes every day with like one day break in between and I felt like I had more energy. The symptoms, I still got a high heart rate, but I didn't feel the adrenaline as much. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Um... Natalie, I'm so happy to hear that. When we spoke seven weeks ago, you um, were not in, in this kind of state. And I, I think that is testament to your remarkable uh, achievement and, kind of, and the, the ability to stick to the routine and actually to, to start pushing yourself. So the, the, the key advice about exercise is that if you exercise and you come away with more energy and feeling good the next day, you're, you're not doing too much. If you do exercise and you come away feeling completely washed up the three days after, you're doing too much. So the pacing with COVID is not whether I can or can't do, it's how much and how aggressive can I start doing? And actually the answer doesn't come from your doctor. The answer comes from within because you know yourself how you feel. And actually you've done a phenomenal thing with your uh, recumbent bicycle because not only are you bent forwards like on a, on a road cycling bike, not a mountain bike, but you're bent forwards, your, your pedaling motion is actually, if I may draw it here, is actually starting to squeeze your calf muscles here. When you pedal your bike and you pedal your bike using your quads and your calf, this motion where you are pedaling, the rotational activity will, will, if you like, squeeze the blood in a muscular, peris, almost a peristaltic way with, with sequential contraction to push the blood back up. And this is perhaps unlike uh, cross trainer where your legs are straight but you're moving back and forth um, and, and a bike is is the best example of this because you're supported you're not fighting gravity so much the other machine that really is good is actually a rowing machine but not many people can fit a rowing machine in their homes so you don't need a road bike converted with a stand you can buy one of those what's called an exercise resistant pedal for something like 40 pounds 
online and you just Google it, it's one of those heavy contraptions that is about this big uh, that you can put against a wall, sit on a chair and start to pedal and vary the resistance. And that's 40 pounds for a pretty good physio rehab uh, that gets you out of the standing position. Because the key thing is that running or going upstairs or doing something that is uh, having to fight gravity is, is always going to be more challenging than a recumbent exercise. So you, you've done very well to do 40 minutes a day, six days a week. That's phenomenal. And I that, only started last week, so <laughs> well, it's but, only been six times. But that is still extremely good. And, and what, what, what I would say, I mean, if you, if you um, told your story seven weeks ago, or you know, maybe at day 20 or day 30 post-COVID, would you think you are in this position now with respect to exercise? I suppose at that point I didn't realize what I had and how long it was going to go on and now it's been more than three months and I was obviously hoping it would never last this long. Um, mm. But there was definitely times when I thought I was really, really unwell and I couldn't really see it happening. But even when we spoke, I did a bit of cycling. So I was never so bad that I could never do it. But I think the fact that I'm now realizing that doing it more, like actually putting myself out there, doing it more makes me feel better. I think that's a good step in the right direction because obviously when you're not well, exercise sometimes seems counterintuitive. So finding that right balance, what you were saying about finding your own limits and making sure you're not going, going over that. And also when you're feeling that you've overdone it, actually recognizing to rest that day and not to push it, that's really important as well. And that's what I've been doing. Yeah, and that pacing strategy is something that we would always advise uh, patients to, to listen to your body. And, you know, the other aspect of stress, and, and thankfully, I asked you at the beginning, you don't have that overarching stress, which is A, work stress or the threat of a loss of job, social stress, relationship stress, and financial stresses. All these clearly will enhance this adrenaline state. We talked about the hypervigilant brain which is under alert all the time. If you have multiple inputs, one input to your brain is actually the adrenaline from low blood pressure, right? And that form of stress, which I just described in the previous diagram is called orthostatic stress. And this orthostatic stress is something that we see fairly commonly in autonomic dysfunction. Now, the other forms of stress that can also impact your adrenaline output which may not be so relevant in you, but just good to be mindful is a stress with, as I say, work, with social connections, with the lockdown, and feeling isolation, with financial stress, and relationships, if that becomes frustrated or frayed during times of the lockdown. These are all factors that clearly, perhaps not all in, in your case, but in other patients, will have an impact on the amount of expressed fright or flight response that happens uh, beyond the standing type of response, that is to say beyond orthostatic intolerance. So it's important to also just acknowledge that all this can play a role. Now, if we come back to the top tips, you said fluid front-loaded salt with your broth, um, and exercise, which will be good at reconditioning your body. And I think exercise is a key aspect of autonomic recovery. And the question most patients ask me is, how do I know when I'm better or I'm, I can do more? And I say to them, listen to your body. When you've gone through a day where you've been upright most of the day, you've gone for a brisk walk, or in your case, a 40-minute cycle, and you come home and you feel good. You don't feel over... Uh, overexerted and you're not washed up for three days after you're recovering and actually be kind to yourself in that you might still have up and down days for example uh, you mentioned when we last met that your monthly cycle may also be a factor in down days or very bad days do you want to tell me a bit about that yeah, so I found that in the days leading up to my period and maybe at the start of my period, uh, some of my symptoms would flare and become a lot worse. And then obviously um, mood, mood um, swings have always been difficult for me during that time, but now it seems they are a lot 
like um, enhanced a lot or well, that's an aggravated response so to say so um i found it helpful um and it kind of goes back to what you're saying about the other stresses the financial i mean the, there were definitely times when i was worrying as well because i'm a freelancer and i can't, I can't get sick pay and these things they they stressed me out and that added to that and what um what i did is um i i got some counseling through through the nhs actually um to help with cope also with the uncertainty of the situation having an illness that no one has really know exactly what it is yet officially um even though there are some um indicators and the uncertainty of how long it will last and um, whether it will be permanent or not, or whether you know all of these all of these things uh, to have um, someone to talk to um, who is a neutral um, person that really helped and also helps to have these tools available during that time before you before my period when I know okay this is a bad day but tomorrow will probably be a better day and also having experienced that a few times I know it will pass again and that does help a lot that knowledge. I mean, that, that is one of the fundamental um, mindsets of re recovery. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. From the time I first met you, I kind of uh, was very impressed with your mindset. And you appeared to understand everything I said and had the expectation of recovery. And to a certain extent, if we take a step back and we look at the role of the autonomic nervous system, it is ultimately to look after your subconscious or automatic functions right so um, unlike my my finger which I'm moving by a thought I'm thinking move my finger or I'm thinking speak and I say these words it's a very conscious effect I am not thinking heart beat faster and you are not thinking that it just happens right that's how the autonomic nervous system works so if I said to you, what are the inputs into this autonomic nervous system that could influence this? And I would say these are feelings rather than thoughts. Because when you feel good and you feel hope and you know that you have an expectation that you will recover because you understand things. And then you do your exercise, you come away, you don't feel that bad, you feel quite good you instill that very positive emotion and your autonomic nervous system ultimately are is influenced by emotions and feelings so i think it's very good of you to keep that positive mindset and actually as you said when you have a setback and your monthly cycle may be a setback it may not be the only setback you might have financial setbacks social setbacks relationship setbacks or whatever random flares of autonomic disturbances a very hot night for example unseasonally so may may make your next day really rubbish because you've lost a lot of fluid more than you can recover even with your drinking know that this is the waxing and waning of the autonomic nervous system and soon this will also pass so just having that knowledge and actually putting a positive slant will also help I think on, I, I would like to try and share with you something which is my inner balance screen. And I know that uh, you, you bought this after I spoke with you and you've achieved some impressive results. The inner balance is a heart rate variability app that I've just turned on. I've clipped onto my earlobe. So you have this as well. I'm just going to clip the one, the other side into here. I'm Bluetooth connected to my iPad. And what I'm going to show you and maybe you can talk me through as the expert user. Sure. Is that, is that it's scanning for it and the sensor is found. And what Natalie is gonna tell you now, because she uses this, is she's gonna say that I'm following the breath on the breath pacer here. Is this familiar yeah. to you? Yeah, you can see this at the top, the little ball moving around. Now you're breathing in, and then when the ball is on the other side uh, of the screen, you'll be breathing out again. And below you can see um, a graph which measures heart rate variability. And um, the goal is through breathing to get into a state of coherence and not just through breathing, but also through um, channeling positive emotions, maybe an appreciation for someone that you care about. And actually 
I can see that you'll be getting into high coherence soon because your graph is looking like a nice sinus wave. So that blue dot that we see there right now, it will be turning green. There it is. It just turned green right now. Um, and on the, on the top left, you can see the coherence score 4.59. That's, that's already very good, very good and it's going to increase even more. Um, and yeah, what that does, that slow breathing, uh, for me anyway, um, it, it helps me activate my parasympathetic nervous system and it makes me feel calmer and sometimes even can calm my heart rate down sometimes. Natalie, I didn't uh, train you on this. Oh my goodness, you just nailed it. So what Natalie has just described to you is a phenomena where at the beginning of my breath technique, my heart rate was in the 90s and it was not so much the heart rate, but actually the heart rate variability profile was doing a bit of this. The moment I slowed my breathing down to a six second cycle, you remember that ball going left and right? I was following that in, going this way, and out breath going that way. You could see I could immediately control heart rate. So this is a very, very powerful demonstration of direct control of your autonomic nervous system. Because you remember I said you can't control your heart rate. How can you think of reducing your heart rate? Well, it turns out you can. You can control your heart rate. And if your dominant symptom, Natalie, is palpitations, I would urge you to continue practice, practicing your heart math in this way. For, for example, 10 minutes when you wake up, 10 minutes before you go to sleep. Yeah. And ensure that before you practice, you are in a in a calm mental state. So you said, think of something positive and gratitude is one of the most positive emotions that you can couple with this breathing technique to get this very nice coherent sinusoidal state. Now, I'm, I got there fairly quickly. I don't know how, but it just came and it's because you put me so at ease and I didn't <laughs> have to think about talking through it because you were talking through it so nicely. But what we're looking for is actually this pattern, Natalie, a sinusoidal pattern rather than this jaggedy pattern, which, which is the pattern of somebody who's not coherent or at stress, or when there's too high an autonomic state. And this sinusoidal pattern that I've just drawn is something that should follow a slow, deep breathing technique, ideally through your nose, in and out, for six seconds in and six seconds out. This pattern of heart rate variability, when you are in a stress or fright or flight mode looks like this. When you're frustrated and angry or when you have autonomic dysfunction and you're standing up, it's very difficult to calm your heart rate. But if you're frustrated, this is the kind of difficulty in regulating the waveform. So it's not the heart rate itself, it's actually the pattern of regularity, the pattern of regularity you see here in the heart rate. And I would urge you, if you can, to kind of read this blog, which is available on my website called Top Morning Tips for Increasing Focus and Energy and Dialing Down That Fright or Flight Response. It takes about eight minutes. But there is talk about waking up and feeling or doing a gratitude list, which is what I still do to this day and what I would like to achieve. So a manifestation wish list. And for you, it could be, I want to run, or I want to cycle, I want to go out for a walk, and I want to feel better. And then the third thing is we talked about is the heart math, which could be five minutes or 10 minutes. A simple eight to 10 minute routine every day may well dial down that fright or flight response. We talked previously about uh, some of the things that we were doing to try and help. And if I looked at this now, there's one other thing which, I don't know whether you were able to do or not. Let me ask you, did you do compression or not? I did, I did do com compression. Um, I have ordered the ones, I got them prescribed through my GP actually. Um, I think Sigvaris uh, is yeah. the brand, uh, that's what the brand's called. And I've got the ones that go all the way up to the tummy from the Good. Um, toes. And um, I think they, they do help. I haven't noticed like a massive difference but um, I think it's just an added, um, an added thing that helps, I guess. And yeah, all, these, so all these measures probably add 
up together. I, I think j just to finish off on the compression, there are two modes of compression. One, you discuss the lower limb compression, which goes from your toes or your ankles all the way to your lower waist or your navel or uh, to your upper thigh. Th those two compressions are fine. And what compression does is it puts some squeezing into your, um, it squeezes your veins externally. And this compression stockings push blood back up. And just like your muscles that are compressing when you cycle or when you squeeze in a form of exercise called isometric counterpressure exercises, compression externally can also help. But one thing that I may not have explained to you, and this might be new to you, is to try abdominal binders, which may be easier, which will be, sorry, easier to fit. But yeah. the abdominal binders are some things that you can get, for example, by Googling or going to Amazon and buying something from Everyday Medical, which is an umbilical hernia binder with a Velcro strap that can tighten round mm. and can give you more or less compression. And this will be helpful in squeezing the blood that is pooling in your gut. We haven't talked about your guts, but your gut as well can be a huge reservoir of blood, which I'm drawing here. And any help with compression of your gut can push the blood back from your capillaries in the, in the gut that are the size of a football field in surface area. Can you imagine that? So you can lose a lot of blood after a big carbohydrate meal. All that can be compressed, or not all, most of it can be compressed back to maintain a decent cardiac output. The other thing is, have you tried changing your meal um, times or meal quantities? So for example, low carb meals, Natalie. Well, I did notice the carb, um, carb heavy meals would make me feel worse. So I've tried to be a bit more mindful of that. And what I'm doing at the moment is I'm trying to eat all my meals before 4 p.m. because I find that um, it, I sleep a lot better when my body isn't digesting. So when I've had a long time without going, like without eating before going to, to bed. So um, I try to eat smaller meals so that the system doesn't to become too overloaded. That is absolutely right. And one of the key things I would say is really to reduce your food intake at dinner time and have an early dinner four hours before sleep. Because when you start digesting, what happens is that the blood necessarily needs to be taken into your gut here. And this blood vessels completely fill up. And so even when you're lying down, your heart is emptying. So contrary to what you think about gravity, this is now food and digestion starting when you're trying to sleep. Not a good process for autonomic dysfunction. So exactly as you say, and you know, coming back to the prevailing problem you still have with the nighttime sleep. I think those are gonna be some of the fundamental things that make you better. One top tip which will lead on to what you asked me to discuss is cool, keeping cool. And I find that drinking a cold glass of water, maybe half an hour, 15 minutes before you sleep, just to cool your system down can be helpful as well, especially if you're so wound up at night. Because imagine you've been fighting or flighting all day, adrenaline is rampant and has been throughout the daytime when you've been sat on your PC or, or being upright. And I, by the way, I consider sitting down being upright and all the time we're pooling. So I'm shaking my legs now. You can't see, but I'm squeezing my buttocks and you can see me bounce, can't you? Maybe I should do that too, yeah. Luteal tension is actually helping to squeeze the blood. And if any of you are watching this, know that you can immediately boost your focus if you suddenly squeeze your calves or suddenly squeeze your gluteal or your buttocks and you might just feel i don't know if you feel it now i can see you doing it you suddenly feel a, an invigorating kind of flash of blood or oxygen in your brain it's because good. you're increasing cardiac output so it's one top tip for uh, combating the post prandial sleepiness prandial means after a food okay so let's talk about Wim Hof. I'm, I'm glad you introduced him because I happen to be a fan. I don't necessarily prescribe him to my patients because there's not enough evidence. But anecdotally, I feel very invigorated when I have a cold shower, which I've started to take religiously since October. Yeah, I have to say, um, and I can add to these anecdotes because 
actually sometimes I found it, but obviously this is just my personal experience. Sometimes I found the breathing exercises. So you essentially hyperventilate for 30 breaths, taking lots of oxygen, oxygenate your body, and then you hold your breath. Um, and then your heart rate, which um, goes up when you're hyperventilating, slows down when you're holding your breath. And then I can hold my breath to up to two minutes um, without feeling like I have to breathe. And then I repeat that for about two, three, four rounds. Um, I do that either in the morning or in the evening or sometimes um, both. And what it does is it helps me slow down my heart rate. That's, it's the most effective I, what I've, out of all of the techniques. It doesn't last very long and it works best on an empty stomach, I find. But when I do it, it's, it's, it almost works like oneness. And what it does also, it makes me um, tolerate the cold a bit better. So what the other component of Wim Hof is, is to have these cold showers or expose yourself to the, to the cold. And um, I find that I'm much, it's much easier for me to acclimatize to the really cold water. And um, that again, is that, it's, it's, that sh it's not really a shock, but it creates almost a controlled adrenaline response, which then again makes it easier um, for me and for my autonomic nervous system maybe to <laughs> regulate itself. I don't know, you, you, no, you will uh, explain it no, better. So, so Wim Hof is W-I-M-H-O-F. We can put the links at the end for those people who are interested. But Wim is a Dutch man who has discovered his own tumor breathing, T-U-M-M-O, which were seen back in the early kind of uh, 20th century by explorers going to um, the Himalayas where they saw monks meditating in the coal for hours or days on end um, and generating heat where the snow would just melt ice off their body and they, they wouldn't be frostbitten like most of the explorers in their super kit. So Wim has discovered that almost independently through a practice of self-breathing and you can read this in his book but my own take on that with a physiological slant and understanding a bit about the autonomic nerve system is that imagine you are a hunter-gatherer and all what is natural for you is you're gathering something and then suddenly you're confronted with an autonomic challenge and that is let's say a saber-toothed cat or a bear jumping out of the cave now you are bound to and you need to generate a very, very strong fight or flight response. But you, if you can outrun the bear and you live, or if you can kill the bear because you fight, then you bring it home for dinner into the village, you should be able to completely wind down and have a feast that means the villagers all eat and then you sleep for 24 hours. That should be, or that is the primitive uh, way of being. And if you look at pythons or animals in the savanna, like a lion, they make one kill in three months and that's it. So they are always in a constant state of more relaxed with intermittent bursts of sympathetic nervous system when they need to make the kill, right? Now, what Wim Hof does and what the cold shower and the breath hold does is that it really strongly activates the sympathetic nervous system and it gives you like a cold shock response. So all of a sudden you're getting this surge like you're fighting this fright of the, the saber tooth cat. But you know what? Once you finish the shower and you come out, you can wind down. And it's this process where you can wind it down, which is what you said to me. Your ability to dial up and dial down is, is, is training your autonomic nervous system to not only upregulate quickly and then downregulate quickly, but over repeated training, you can get a sense of calm and come back to what I call our primitive natural state. You know what is unnatural? What is unnatural is I've got this stupid device next to my bedside that I'm checking all the time. The first thing I wake up, I look at it. Before I go to sleep, I look at it. I'm reading news. Apple do a very nice news bulletin and you flick, 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 and then suits. Before you know it, an hour has passed. So I've stopped this habit and I put it on airplane mode. And if I can, I put it away from my bedside. Because all this news and emails and Instagram feeds and whatever else we do is constantly giving us a low trickle of this saber tooth cat fright or flight. And so the other way to live is to live knowing 
that we are in a very unnatural state. And what more to accentuate that than your long COVID status? Because your long COVID status is giving you such a heightened, constant adrenaline rush that you don't need to be working in a, in a whatever, 13-hour job or 16-hour job. You don't need to be in social isolation. You don't need to have any of these additional risk factors. You're already getting all those static stress. But can you imagine if you amplify this with all the other factors we talk about, especially our phone, our TV, and everything else that keeps us on high alert, this will accentuate the worst of the autonomic dysfunction symptoms. And actually coming back to your point, it would appear to me, and this is probably new to you, it would appear to me, Natalie, that since we last met, you've made great strides. You've come off your beta blocker, which is great. You're exercising 40 minutes a day, six times a week. Now, I look at that objectively as your doctor. I think she's making good progress. You're drinking, you're salting, you've just got the, um, the exercise on a bike, fine, that's quite recent, but you're getting your compression, you might get abdominal compression, and you're in a positive headspace. I think your trajectory is gonna go phenomenally good. And anyone else watching this, if they look at the principles of management here, and then you add in the wonder of thought, emotion, feelings to dampen down that, immune, that autonomic nervous system, plus breathing, which you've started to do. And I know you told me your coherence can reach 6.5. That is a very, very high and excellent level of coherence. Try and get that twice a day, every day, because that will eventually train your vagus. And when you do Wim Hof, that will train your sympathetic nervous system. So it comes up, but then it shoots right back down when you come back out of the cold shower because you remove yourself from the threat. Um, does that all make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe another thing that's really helped me was uh, you recommended that book to me, James Nestor Breath. So I downloaded an audiobook of that. And I, when I went on gentle walks, which I did from time to time, I would always put that on. And yeah, he's got some good pointers. He talks about Wim Hof as well, actually. Yeah, so he, he, he does. I mean, my, my favorite book of the year so far is Breath by James Nestor. And so I quote that for a lot of my patients with autonomic dysfunction to, to read. And I guess the takeaway message from Breath is that there is a perfect breathing cycle. This is the breathing cycle that are used by kind of nuns with their rosemary beads or by mantra people uh, who are meditating using mantras uh, because when they, when they speak the mantra or they, they say it in their minds, it anchors the breath. And that breath, the perfect cycle is 5.5 seconds. I don't know whether you read that from the book. Yeah, yeah I did, yeah. That's what I set my heart math to, to I think 12 seconds I set it to, so six and seconds. Yeah, yeah, so most people do six, six, but I, I feel more comfortable actually on eight, eight, which is strange because it comes out of the perfect breath. But I think it's a, it's a variable thing. You, you breathe in whichever way you're comfortable. But James Nestor says five and a half seconds is the perfect breath in and out. So an 11 second cycle is what it should be. And that's effectively five and a half breaths per minute. It's a lot slower than most of us are taking. So just the mindful breathing on a day-to-day -day basis, whenever you catch yourself doing nothing or just watching TV, breathe slower. And I think that breath slowing technique that I showed you with my waveform, the waveform on inner balance could really help anchor your your palpitations or, or minimize the palpitation sensation because you are trying to bring it down. With every out breath, you bring it down. And when you gain this variability and a high coherence, you're in control. You're in autonomic control again. So it's, it's possible. Um, now, I, I, I think it's been more uh, close to an hour. I, I wonder whether there, there's anything else that you, know, you, you felt helpful to share with some of our other listeners. Uh, to help them on their journey or to help them understand what the process is like and top tips from your point of view, Natalie? Well, I think we've covered most of them, but what I would also say is don't be afraid to ask for help and yeah, recognize that this is something that you probably need the support of other people um, from, uh, with, and that's, uh, that's, it's just good, good to have that. And 
um yeah because some people i know there's there's a lot of people who some from long COVID who might have been like very high achievers before being very used to being very independent and i i for sure was like that too so asking for help is not easy for me but i just recognize that when i do i feel better if i can reduce that orthostatic stress a little bit i tell you tell you another secret asking for help allows another person to feel valuable you're often surrounded by friends and family who actually want to help and they are very sympathetic and understanding and saying no 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 i can do it i can do it and then suffering is um, isolating yourself. So asking for help actually enhances that connection. And I think don't underestimate that, that kind of increasing bond and the, and the feeling that your loved ones, friends and family can help you is actually helping them because giving sometimes is also a very healing thing to do. And when they give, they also feel uh, more connected and they, they feel they can actually contribute to your recovery. So um good so you know i'm i'm pleased that you've come today i'm i'm very um i'm very impressed by your description of heart math but also by the whole stepwise approach that you've taken since our conversation seven weeks ago and although you're not fully there yet i think you are equipped with all the principles and the understanding to make greater strides forward i think the two things more i i would guess would be abdominal compression and that cold water technique at night and eating earlier, which you've started to do. But potentially if two or three hours is not enough, uh, not early enough, power back to kind of four, five, six hours. I'm personally on an intermittent fasting regime and I've stopped eating dinner. And to be honest, my latency for sleep is now very short. So I hit on the pillow, I'm asleep five minutes after. So it is, I'm finding that cold showers at night plus very little to eat or to stimulate your digestive system makes for a much better sleep. And I think also putting the phone away. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much for your time. I uh, will bring this recording to a close. Thank you. Thank well, you thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you.